All right. Now then, what we happen is we get sort of attached to the data stream if you're doing a lot of work. What's the first thing you typically want to do? A lot of you guys are already, when you got a problem that you're fighting with, the first thing you'll do is grab the scan tool. When we had the HHR that when it's been over a while ago, Dakota goes for the scan tool. Everybody got to go. Nothing wrong with that. Basically, you just go, hey, let's see what we can see. You know what I'm saying? Well, what if you run into a situation where you can't see nothing? Um, I'm going to tell you here, some of the rules, this is important for this story, some of the rules haven't changed. We talked about that. Carburetor, fuel injected, it doesn't matter. This is a breakdown of a carburetor, you know, with your choke, throttle plate. Basically, you got a little venturi effect right here. Whenever you see how it gets a little right there, whenever air goes through there, it creates a little pressure and it draws fuel out of the jets, out of that bowl. This one here, you got a pressurized fuel rail that squirts it in there. But, as far as what the engine sees, it needs to see the same thing. Uh, when the throttle is open, well, a cold engine needs more fuel in the mix than a warm engine. And when the throttle is open, extra fuel is needed, even on a hot engine. Because whenever, if you look out there, how many of you guys on that, uh, on that little 350, it's got a carburetor on it we play around with. If you open the throttle, you see two squirts of fuel. Psh, like that, right? That's the accelerator pump. And the injectors do that on a fuel-injected engine. All right, so too much fuel, you get a black cloud. Uh, lots of hydrocarbon, or a no-start and a wet spark plug. Wet spark plugs will not fire. We talked about that yesterday, right? Uh, if you looked at everything else, good idea to pull a spark plug out and see what it looks like. If it looked like that, you may as well pull all of them out. Either clean them with your blaster or put some more in there. Of course, if the new ones get wet, you're going to have to clean them anyway. The PCM depends on sensor inputs to make fuel calculations and high fuel pressure, a saturated canister, a stuck open injector, a ruptured regulated diaphragm, can deliver unneeded fuel. I used to see those fuel pressure regulators that would go bad on the inside. You first check your pressure, it would look just fine. Then when you could tap that regulator, it would bounce up to 100 pounds. And it would be a rich running problem. The regulator is easy enough to change. You know? All right, so fuel injection. Why fuel injection instead of a carburetor? What we want is smaller and smaller droplets. So you get better atomization, more of a fine gasoline mist with fuel injection than you do with carburetor. And also, you're putting the fuel closer to the end or even into the combustion chamber on GDI. A lot of your stuff, you have gasoline direct injection. Uh, you work on that some. You got a low pressure system, you got a high pressure system that's driven off the camshaft. You got injectors that are putting the fuel right in there. You can actually put it in there not only can you put the amount of fuel in there you want, you can put it in there any way you want. You can put a stratified charge or a homogenous charge. You can time the injection of the gasoline if it's a gasoline direct injected vehicle. But it's going straight in there. Now, Europe's been doing this for years. We're, we're doing it. We're in, into it up to our eyeballs now. Have been for several years now. Now, GDI systems are replacing the regular EF5 because you get tiny, tiny, tiny droplets. Tiny droplets means you get better flame propagation, more complete combustion of the fuel. You get smaller engines, more power. Most every engine that you see in any kind of a passenger car uh, in, in Europe is a four-cylinder engine. You hardly ever see anything with more than four cylinders over there. Not even be six. All right. So. Donnie was working without OBD2. OBD2 was what became mandatory in 1997. Okay, 94 started showing up on some cars. Uh, GM did this silly thing in 1995 where that OBD2 connector under the dash, but it was still OBD1, just really throw you for a loop. And so, one way or another, he said, this van's kicking me around. This is an old OBD1 thing. On the Ford, and back in the day, you didn't plug in under the dash. You're like on a Chrysler, you plugged in under the hood. You had a connector under there that was a test connector. He was working on a high mileage 1990 Ford van that had eaten his lunch and his supper for several days. He was stumped, all right? And when it runs really rich when you first start it, and it puffs black smoke so it warms up. It had a data stream to do a lot more with it. It was worse when it was cold, it was when it warmed up. And he said, the diagnostic trouble coder, are, I get aren't telling me anything. He said, I don't have any information here I'm getting for that. It was in that peculiar Ford limo around 1990 when they first started putting the data stream on most everything, Ford got it, I mean, Continental got it in 1988. Everything else started getting it as they, well, like for example, when these vans here went from an AO, uh, AOD transmission to a uh, E4OD, since they had to redo that program, and they went ahead and put the uh, data stream on there. Uh, but anyway, uh, if, you, if it's a 90 model Ford uh, E4OD, it'll have that. If, or if it's got mass airflow, it'll have data stream, but Mustangs, even though they got mass airflow in 89, didn't get data stream until 94, which was a real drag, because up all the way up through 93, you know, when you had a little Fox Body Mustangs or whatever you want to call them, 
I, I guess that's what you're going to talk about anyway. I'm not a race car nut. But um, anyway, you need a window into the system. He was hamstrung and spoiled. And it be needless to say, when you open the hood on a van, you ain't got a lot of room to piddle around up in there and get your sensors and all. All right, so you get into the PCM's head, scan tool data stream, let us see things like fuel trim that you cannot see with hard measurements. You cannot measure fuel trim with a scope. You can't measure fuel trim with a voltmeter. You can't measure fuel trim with anything except the PCM feeding it on that little two wire line with your scan tool. Know what the PCM is thinking is important if you want to find out what's going on. And a scope is really necessary too, but a scan tool is an easy first step. What we're going to do is we're going to start with what's easy, and then if we have to go harder, we'll go harder. All right. Now, help at hand. This is what the self-test connector looks like on a Ford. Basically, here's your data link. Got five volts there. You ground that one and it puts it in self-test. And the self-test uh, codes flash out right here. They also flash out on the check engine light. But you got that one. Your data link is on these two terminals right here. Now, on a Ford, if it's got these two terminals right here in that connector, it has data stream. Now, I had noticed that when I was working there, but I mean, this was, I was over helping him one you know, day when I was off from over here. And I said, you've got data stream in this van. He said, well, the scan tool says I don't. And I says, uh, you've got the route your model in there and everything. Tell it you've got an E4OD transmission. He said, well, I don't have an E4OD transmission. And I says, well, Lie to it. Tell it you got an E4OD transmission. When he did that, it gave him data stream, and all of a sudden he could see what he was doing. And what we had was, see, the first AOD equipped vehicle I'd ever seen was a data stream, but when I looked at those two wires, I said, you got data stream on here, just not using it. And that's what that tester looked like. We got one in there that um, displays kind of screwed up on it. That's a $2,000 tool, or well, it was probably more than that now. He did what I said, and he went wide. He said, I didn't know I had data stream. What he found, was the throttle position and sensor voltage was just floating. You know, it finds closed throttle, and if it goes above closed throttle, it starts putting all them extra squirts in there because it thinks you're giving it a gas, and that was making all that black smoke. Now that he had a scan tool, now if he'd have gone down in there underneath the bottom of the throttle body, if he'd have, you know, pricked into that little green wire coming off the throttle position sensor, it read the voltage, or maybe put a scope on it, he'd probably caught it. But that is really hard to get to, and he didn't even think about the TP sensor might be causing it, you know, a rich running problem like that. So it was an in-range failure. If a sensor fails in range, if it's not, if it doesn't wobble out of where it's supposed to be, the engine controller usually doesn't even know it has failed. Because it's looking for it to go wide, you know, drop out or go too high. Okay. So, this is an in-range failure. Now let's go on. Now, another Camry adventure. OBD1, no data stream. Uh, this Gary guy, he drives a bunch of older cars, and we put a mass airflow sensor on an 89 Maxima he had for a, a no idle problem. He's really happy with that. <laughs> and this high mileage Camry, he his daughter's Camry comes in there. Uh, it never happened when he was driving, she said it likely quit or fail to start several times a day. And no matter what, if you know, you don't want to be driving your car and it just quit on you. It usually interrupts your routine or your grocery trip or whatever. You don't really like that. All right, it's supposed to talk, but it wasn't. We were supposed to be able to plug in there. We had the right adapters and everything, but for whatever reason, we couldn't get the scan tool to talk to the nerve. Now, we're having to work with our data stream on when it's supposed to have it. That was no fun with it. So, where do you start on something like that? Go through the basics. Yeah, you do. Basics is not a bad idea, but I mean, if you've got an intermittent, you really need to kind of catch it in the act, don't you? And if you've got an intermittent, the worst thing you can do is start pulling on wire harnesses because you may pull it away from whatever it's shorted to or something, and then it may not act up for several days, then it's going to come back again, and they're not going to be happy, or maybe another record bill. You know, who pays for the third and the fourth record bill? That's not a good plan, is it? You've seen that kind of thing, haven't you? Haul it in, by the time they claim it's fixed, leaves, breaks down again, had to haul it in again. The record guy, he's getting his money every time. So it ain't his fault. All right, choose the right path. So we had choices. We could dig for the no communication problem. How long would that take? Right? Or we can attack this clear the old-fashioned way. All right, let me see what Chris wants. Hey, Chris, let me call you back. I'm in the middle of the class. All right. All right, could we win the fight? All right, let's try that. Let's do it the old-fashioned way. Now, when I first started working on uh, fuel injection stuff, uh, back in the mid-'80s when I started doing a lot of it, and I was working at the Ford dealership then. Of course, my dad had been working on fuel injection before that. But one way or another, I realized that that big H manual that they gave you, where you're supposed to go through these trouble matrices, was nothing but a pain in the rear because a lot of times it would just lead you in a circle and you still wouldn't have the car fixed. 
Uh, they were trying to help us with that, but I threw it over there. And when I got cars in there, I would measure the voltage on every sensor, every time. And I got to where I didn't even have to write them down. I could measure them. I knew what they were. I got to make me a long probe with a little alligator clip on it, some heat shrink on it, and I could go in there and back probe those connectors, and I could read those sensors. And I could tell you, after I had read a bunch of them on good cars, as soon as I saw a bad one, I'd say, you know, this is right, that's right. Whoop, that sensor's reading too much. That ain't right. And then I would know to go in there and see if we had a wiring problem or sensor problem, something like that. So let's do something like this. Now I worked on Forge for years with that data stream gather a boulder. Uh, so we fired the camera up. We didn't have any other cameras to compare to. Waited for it to quit. I walked by and noticed it was sitting without running. 30 minutes later after we cranked it up, it, it done died. I said, this is what she's talking about. And that's a good thing. So troubleshooting time. I figured this would be really simple. Did we have spark? Yep. We had an inch of ragged blue lightning that scared the daylight out of it. That's what you want. You don't want something that's an old quarter inch long orange fire that won't even start the car, you know. Sent Lamont over there to work at the uh, uh, Nissan place and they put him working on a Cadillac that was on a used car lot. And it wouldn't start, wouldn't start, wouldn't start. And I said, check spark, what's it look like? He told me it wasn't that long. I said, put a call on it. He did that and fired up. He said, I told you that. It's cool. Weren't you listening? You don't pay attention. We hadn't checked the fuel pressure or the fuel quality yet. But the pump was running really smooth. We could hear it. It was spinning. The injectors were clicking. Now, that eliminated a crank sensor concern. The PCM was definitely awake. What about some weird ignition timing concerns? Well, we put the timing light up. And we connected the number one wire, and the spark event was happening right when it should have been, but real steady. That was totally acceptable. It was flashing right there. All right, we'll try something quick and easy. Pull the air cleaner off, shoot a little carb spray in there. See if it'll start on that. You ever do that? Fire a little carb spray, ether or something in there? See if it'll fire up? Because you know the ignition system working. We figured it'd get a bust off on that, but it didn't. It didn't happen. Fuel starvation was a problem. It would have started with the carb spray and then died whenever it burned all that up. You see how you think? You know what I mean? You're just trying to eliminate stuff. You find out what it's not. All right, the people had a lot torn with one of these. Things gets personal. It's, it's you and this machine, man. You're going you to whoop this thing. You're not going to walk away. You know what I'm saying? Now, sometimes you may go home. And there's one guy that was teaching. When I say go home at night, you come back and they play. This guy that was teaching a class up there when I went to KC Vision. Uh, most of the instructors, or not most of them, some of the instructors up there are like this. I've never seen anything I couldn't figure out. I'm smarter than anybody in the room. Nobody's as good as I am. That's the way they come across, right? Well, there's one guy, you know, he talked with his ex in like he was from up in the northeast somewhere. And he told me, he was telling us about he had worked on one and worked on one and worked on one and worked on it, couldn't figure it out, worked on it, worked on it, went fishing, took a couple of days off, went home, worked on it some more. <laughs> and then everybody in that room was quiet. You know why? Because everybody in that room had been there. Everybody had seen that. Everybody had been there. And he says, he says, I was beat to <laughs> whenever I went back to work. But he finally figured it out. You know what I'm saying? Well, that other guy, some of these other guys, they will never tell you about the one they couldn't figure out. They'll tell you, I figured this out really easy. Nobody else could. You know? Of course, i got some stories like that, too. But I'll tell you what, I've been beat up. <laughs> and this one here was kind of beating us up a little bit. It'll take more than a wrench is to get this one on the map. Okay, so fuel pressure testing, just because. So this one here, you had to take that little banjo bolt out. And you had to put a little spitting in there that you could hook your, you know, gauge into it. We got an adapter for that in there. And a digital fuel pressure gauge with a banjo bolt adapter. I had a digital one. The fuel pressure drop was causing a stalling in it to tell the tail. All right, so I let it run until it quit again. And sometimes it takes several hours. Well, when this one quit, it still had good fuel pressure. Fuel pressure was 41 pounds. When the engine died, it was time to see if we had water in the fuel. So we disconnected the fuel out of the tank, connected the hose, energized the pump, and let it empty all of that into a clean container. Tank was empty, saw no water, and we threw up only about 2% alcohol in the mix. So we pumped the clean fuel back in a new cigar. Mm -hmm. there. But, time to bust out the old school. Uh, the most sensible trace I could think of was an injector pulse. Let's just see what that's doing. This is pretty doggone interesting. There is a no start after a quit. It was really wide. This is how long the injector was open. This right here is really reading, and then whenever it pulls it down to zero on that trigger wire, it was a really, really wide pulse. I said, that's not right. That is way under too much fuel. I mean, I think this hose is fuel in there, and they're going to trigger by the engine controller, but what in the world is going to make the pulse be that dead gun wide? This is a normal pulse. See that? See the difference? This is a wide pulse. See? Now that one and that one 
how much difference there are. This is when it was starting and running normally. We are on to something. We picked up on something. All right. As the engine was running, see, I always restart it when it cooled off. Notice that it was almost starting, only 20% of that. So when the engine was running, the injector trace, the pulse would just widen by itself sometimes for no apparent reason. So I was closing in on the cause of it. So I targeted a time when it was starting just fine, and then I disconnected the fuel pump and created my no start to see if maybe that was something, maybe it was spreading it out because it wasn't getting enough fuel. Was it expanding the pulse trying to get the engine to start, or was the wide pulse the reason? Now this was with no fuel pressure. That don't look like what we got, does it? And this was a normal pulse. So it only was a slightly wider with no fuel pressure. So never went over about 10 milliseconds even with no fuel pressure, so the wide pulse was affected by some other cause. But what was it? Well, the crank cam sensor, the new injector panel on speed, density system, the ECT, TP, MAP, and IET are modified input. So I started with the easy assist with access and found a problem. The engine coolant temperature sensor was spending a lot of time at or near 5 volts. That's like it was unplugged. That's 40 below zero. You got it? 40 below zero means you'd have to have a lot of fuel. That's what's going on. Very cold engine. And that's what the signal looked like. We hooked the scope up to that. And when it was going, it would do this. And then it would start raggling down like this. This was more normal than that one. It shouldn't be up close to 5 volts. And when it was up here, you'd have a pulse that wide and it wouldn't start. If it jumped up here while you're driving, poof, you're dead in the water. If you're listening sometimes, if that engine could look cool the temperature on a Toyota or some of the other ones, goes up close to 5 volts, the fan will kick off. I don't remember hearing that on this one. But anyway, plug the sensor back in and kill the engine or cause it to run rough. It's an easy test and a simple fix. Now, that's question one. Number your paper, guys. This is a test. This is only a test. And it's not the emergency broadcasting system. All right, you ready? Ignition A says, as a general rule, there is no direct electrical connection between the primary and secondary windings on distributorless ignition system packs. That's this kind right here. B says, if one spark plug wire is disconnected from the distributorless ignition coil, the companion tower of that coil will not fire. Who's correct about that? I can put you a schematic of the inside of the coil here. There's your primary, there's your secondary. Which of the following reasons for a cylinder misfire is least likely to raise hydrocarbon emissions? That means black smoke. Right? Foul spark plug? Shorted spark plug wire. That means it ain't no dangerous spark into the plug. Stuck open injector or low fuel pressure? Which one of those is least likely to cause hydrocarbon emissions? Which is the black smoke. All right. On well, a four liter straight six engine, when cylinder number one is on its compression stroke, cylinder number six is where? Compression intake exhaust the power. Right. On a straight six. I could have asked the question about a straight four. When number one is on compression, where would cylinder number four be? Is this separating the men from the boys? says some engines will run with a sensor unplugged. That's basically talking about the cam sensor. Uh, technician B says the crank sensor always produces an analog rather than a digital signal. Analog signal is one like this. Digital signal is on off. I meant to put cam right there. I dropped the ball on that. A PCM is believed to have a bad injector driver because the injector is inoperative. Technician A says a known good PCM from a similar vehicle should be connected to the problem vehicle with some identified diagnosis. 
Magnesium B says the circuit controlled by the burned out driver should be checked for a low resistance or short. Who's correct? Technician A says there's no reason to check the ignition timing of an engine with no timing adjustment. Technician B says the ignition timing should be checked anyway to eliminate it as a possible cause. <laughs> Is it possible to have ignition timing that's off even though you can't adjust the timing? Engine vacuum reads 13 inches on a no idle or a 318 Dodge pickup engine with a distributor. That ain't good. Should read 18 to 22, right? Idle. Engine starts a little hard and runs a lot of sluggish, but doesn't smoke. The ignition time has been properly adjusted and the cylinders have an average compression of 130 psi with very little variation between cylinders. The ignition ace is retarded valve timing due to a stretch timing chain may be the problem. Technician B says timing chain stretch can be checked without removing the timing cover. Now I wrote this question for professional technicians. Very small boys may have trouble with this one. Advanced ignition timing can cause A, hard starting, B, ping detonation, C, piston damage, D, any or all of the above. Which of the following is least likely to cause poor fuel economy, low fuel pressure, late ignition timing, running board, the luggage rack, and a bug shield, an electrical accessory mounted too near the PCM? Least likely. This is an ASE style question. I did not get this from the ASE people. I wrote it myself. What's one way you can immediately tell the PCM is awake when checking a no start? They want to back up and look at the answers? We ain't got much time. Technician A is right on this one. Even though this tire right here is shorted, that other one may be popping. If you disconnect one wire, if, uh, it'll still fire on the other one. You know, they try to act like it wouldn't when the first stuff came out, first came out, but that ain't the way it is. Uh, which of the most, I follow the reasons for this solar risk fire, least likely to raise high low fuel pressure. Six is on what? Somebody tell me. Compression. Wait a minute. One's on compression. Oh. You got two cylinders on compression at the same time. What's up with that? Oh. Huh? Exhaust. Exactly. Uh, test question four. Uh, some engines will run with a crank sensor, I mean, with a cam sensor unplugged. Technician B says the crank sensor always produces an analog or the digital signal. Now, some engines won't start with a cam sensor unplugged. Remember yesterday I was talking about the Nissan Altimus. <laughs> it may start, it may not. You know? All right. So, this right here is not true. Yeah. It's going to be a digital signal and so on. So, A. Should have been A. A PCM is believed to have a bad injector. What you don't ever do when you think a driver is destroyed in a PCM is don't ever take a PCM off of a good car or out of a new box and plug it into that sucker. Because if you burn that PCM up, now you got two. <laughs> now, you can take the PCM that's fried and put it on another car and see if the other car runs the same way. Because you're not going to hurt the other car. If it's like that one, you know, if it's the same kind of car. And I've done it that way before. Um, and the technician B says the circuit controlled by the burned out of driver should be checked with low resistance or short. I did a Jeep one time. 
and it basically, uh, of course, those Jeeps, those old uh, and that 87 and 90 Jeeps had a bulletproof fuel injection microprocessor on, but it, the injector driver would heat up and shut down, and it only had like two ohms of resistance. That injector was supposed to have 16, you know. All right, technician A says there's no reason to check an ignition timer. That's not true. You can check it and see if there's something going on with the timer. It's smart to do that, and just to, that, that's basically uh, P on that one. And engine vacuum reads 13 inches. This right here is going to be a stretch timing chain. Right, timing chain check and check, and you can check it. What you do is you get your you want you get it around here to where it's on top dead center on the crank, and then you turn it backwards while you're watching the rotor in your distributor. And the amount you turn it backwards before the rotor starts to move is how much stretch you got. You don't know you don't want over about 10 or 12 degrees of stretch. And, uh, something we used to do all the time. What's so right? Huh? What was right? Oh, no, I forgot how I worded the question. Um, that's uh, both. All right, advanced ignition timing can cause all of that. Um, least likely would be an electrical accessory mounted too near the PCM, although that can happen. It's the least likely. I mean, I can tell you, I got a story about that, but I think I'll tell it right now. Uh, one way is what? Somebody tell me? Spark. Huh? Spark. No, I mean this one here. How can you tell if the engine controller is awake when you're first checking the no-start? You ain't got a scan tool, you ain't got nothing. You switch on the key, what are you listening for? Fuel pump. Mm -hmm. If the fuel pump comes on, the engine controller is awake because it can turn on the pump. Got it? All right. Did everybody score good?